Hi, um, Jennifer Warren here, and I just wanted to offer some takeaways from a conference I was at at the University of Montana with the World Affairs Council on April 16th. And it was, it just so happened that it was three days after Iran um, attacked Israel. And the irony for me is that the last conference I attended with the same group October 10th was three days after Hamas attacked Israel. So it seems that every time I go to the University of Montana, um, there's some Middle East attack three days prior. Um, I know that it's not a, a real coincidence, but it just has so happens this way. But the point is that I was with fantastic Middle East experts and just real, real top level um one of the highlights was Dr. Merdad Kia's presentation about the Middle East, um, Iran, Russia, the United States. And also there were two other panelists, Bob Seidenschwartz and um, Dr. Meyer, who's also um, quite, quite an expert in the Middle East. And But what I just want to mention is you know, some of the discussion of Dr. Kia, he had presented last time and it was in my last takeaway video and and there's some of the that conference material on online on their youtube channel as well and i have all those references on my page from from the past but what is unique this time is that as as we know there has been this you know terrible continuing war between um israel israel and hamas and then finally um iran attacks israel because they in retaliation for something that Israel had done to a, you know, at like a consulate or something like that. Um, and, and so finally the, the memo was that finally Iran has come out into the light and not sort of just being behind its proxies, such as Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, um, and, and in Syria. So, so that was new. And, and what was really notable was that, um, the out, the, the partners that came to help Israel, which included France, the United States, Jordan, and others in the Middle East was really kind of a bit of a sea change in terms of an expression of support, overt support for Israel. Um, and so I, and this is sort of an extension of some, a policy that had been in the works right bef before Biden took over and it was called the Abraham Accords. And Saudi Arabia was about to, you know, come to terms, you know, peace terms with Israel. And now with this situation that just passed, um, it seems like these accords will will advance or some version of these accords. Um, so this is a bit of a sea change. Uh, Dr. Kia's words were that the sands are shifting in the Middle East. And um, I will kind of leave it with that. Next, the other really notable um, event was the Consul General of India. Um, India has installed a new consulate in Seattle. It's the Pacific um, Northwest or, or West area for India. And um, the consul just noted that, you know, the, that consulate, it's been, been in existence now for, you know, technically three months, but um it kind of had been the idea of having a consulate there has sort of been in the works for 30 years. Um, that takes us back to 1994 kind of, and, um, and it took all these events and all this time to pass for them to make that commitment. And so I think what's really kind of interesting about it is the commitment and it speaks really um, to the U S India relationship of the future um just some key thoughts about um 
about India um, that that were presented. He um, the consul gave a presentation, and it's it's really extraordinary. Um, you know, India is a non-aligned country, and and but they also just recently held the G twenty um, presidency last year, and and some sort of notable facts about India is that this year their growth rate is going is expected to be 8.5 percent i had seen figures of 7.5 percent so it's in fact growing faster than than you know some of the official stats flying around um the other thing too is you know they're really really um focusing as well on net zero and sustainability and that was reflected in some of their g20 um you know some of their um final thoughts that they gave. I, they have a summary about the G20. And supposedly they're they're even um, nine years ahead on um, attaining their SDG goals, their sustainable development goals. As for net zero carbon neutrality, um, they expect to be um, carbon neutral by around 2070. Now that, that could happen faster and they have a lot of development ahead of them. And I think with advances in technology, you know, perhaps that can get sped up. And that's that's a whole nother story in, in my wheelhouse for another day. Um, their major priorities are trade, technology, and tourism. Those were three things um, that he noted, but he was also speaking in Montana. And but I think that that is just kind of the general priorities. The other thing I want to note is that. And that he said was, you know, India is um, the largest democracy and we are the oldest democracy. So that's kind of a really um, consequential pairing, I think, for the 21st century. And democracy can be messy. Um, in some respects, their democracy and their their um, priorities seem clearer than ours in some respects. And one of their priorities as well is women empowerment. And it is codified in their legislation. They they have um, mandated that one third of the seats in, um, I guess, the equivalent of their Congress must be held by women. So they are really progressive on the women's empowerment front. And I know personally of a lot of initiatives. And that was reflected by the C20, the civil society groups that represented India at their G20. And there was a lot of communiques about that. And they're absolutely doing it. It's not just talk. It, it is real initiatives, real progress. And in some respects, they may be the most progressive country in the world on women initiatives, which gets me to a point about the Middle East that I will I will note is that these countries like Iran and others where women are subjugated and repressed, those economies will not perform well in the future. And this is a, a noted fact. There is all sorts of research to this effect. And it just is common sense. If you are um, denying 50% of your population opportunities, then that does not bold well on the economic stage. And I think those countries that have policies where women are subjugated, repressed, and all sorts of other things, those are 20th century models. And th this is not a recipe for economic prosperity that's going to be had by others in the future. And I think some of these other Middle East countries within the Abraham Accord umbrella absolutely understand this. And, and so I think it's a new day. Um, while the sands may be shifting in the Middle East, the also the axis of the world will be shifting in, in more positive directions, I feel. Lots of work to be done on that. Um, India has in fact leapfrogged technology in some respects. Um, he noticed uh, noted their public, um, digital public infrastructure, um, where, for example, if there's a disaster, their government can just um, immediately put in, in um, you know, those affected their bank accounts. They've sort of leapfrogged credit cards and gone. So therefore, there's no intermediaries, monies that need to get 
to the right people in need gets there without intermediaries. And during the pandemic, all the all the waste that we saw here in this country when our government had to help many people in need um, during the pandemic and af and you know as it was letting up. Um, we see all these stories of incredible amounts of wasted billions and corruption. And this just, India's approach cuts the corruption right out. Um, there's not all these middlemen, you know, sc scamming, um, you know, monies from the government and that sort of thing. The other thing about India that was notable to me is just that um, AI and quantum computing are priorities. They're priorities here in the United States. And I, just um, talked about it in my talk as well um, when I discuss shifting priorities. And I'll talk about it here in a second. Um, but just to wrap up anything else on India. Oh, the other thing I want to say about um, India and its commitment here in the United States and just its message in general is that I think there's really a unique chance for peace and prosperity. It's really foremost on the minds of others. The other thing India said to their policy is that, you know, they will not engage in dialogues with, with other countries, other parties, unless the violence stops. First, you must stop the violence and then we'll negotiate. Then we can talk. Perfect. Makes perfect sense. So anyway, there were some really, really positive themes expressed by the Consul General and um, India's approach to the world. They are also a voice of the global South. Um, they're a leader to other countries in that respect. So I think I think that's really all positive and progressive as well. Um, so just pivoting a little bit to um, energy, just a few highlights that I gave that segs with, um, you know, some of the Middle East thoughts and, and the thoughts about India and what that means. Um, the thing about India, or I mean, energy is that energy is where we live. It is where the rubber meets the road. Um, it is it is what facilitates economic development and prosperity and a modern way of living. And it has to be done right in the future because we're going to be using potentially a lot of resources. And so really thoughtful approaches have to happen. Um, one, one thing to note is that um, it's really developing Asia where a lot of the demand for natural gas is in the future. And it's reflected in, in a lot of the LNG um, facilities that are online and going to come online. And I will quickly show a few slides um, to that effect. So this is just showing, um, let me put this on full screen, just some of the fundamentals, because that's really what's driving energy demand. Um, right now, we're at about 103 million barrels a day globally of oil. And, and that's going to grow. Um, it, it grows, you know, modestly over the next couple of years. And, you know, we don't really know exactly what the, what the peak will be and when that will be. Um, but regarding natural gas, because natural gas is um, going to be in demand, and a lot of it has to do with the really in large amounts of electricity demand to run to power these modern economies in the future and that growth is to continue up to 2040 and and a lot of it's going to be by way of lng as well as pipeline imports there is absolutely growth of renewables but it's also what's going to happen specifically in china and india is that it's going to increase coal generation and and that has you know, larger carbon emissions. And so, you know, we're going to have to think that through and that could be where nuclear um, power um, starts sort of helping defray some of those emissions in the future. So while natural gas is considered a transition fuel to a cleaner, you know, net zero world, um, you know, we're, we're also going to have to work on cleaning up those emissions and oil and gas firms are, um, through their methane emissions reduction pledges. And that that's supposed to happen. Um, and this just reflects, this is a, this is how the natural gas export export world looks and the jewel tones are 
import facilities. So as you can see, there's in fact more importing going on around the world relative to these warm tones, which are export facilities. And a lot of the export facilities are on the United States Gulf Coast. A lot of the new facilities, according, you know, based on economics, will be coming from the United States. Um, there's some in Africa, some in Australia. Um, Qatar is a large um, exporter of natural gas, LNG as well. Um, and then the other thing I just want to note is I sort of, we, I sort of did a little look back to 2008 when I was writing some um, sort of policy analysis and research works in, in on Far Eastern Economic Review on China and India specifically. And at that time in 2008, that was in fact a high watermark era of globalization. We were importing more from China at that point than ever. And then the financial crisis happened and, and that started downshifting a little bit. And then we have a pandemic and that really starts changing priorities because of all the vulnerabilities that were exposed. And also then once um, Russia invades Ukraine, that really laid bare the, the ideas of energy security, affordability, and the need to have a diverse energy supply, both supply sources and a diverse mix on your grid. And so all that is being worked out and that has great implications for supply chains, has great in implications for trade. Um, you know, this idea of the energy transition is characterized as a cleaner energy transition, but with it, because of the renewables, you know, we're, we're running up against the challenges of density, the need for dense baseload to back up renewables like natural gas and nuclear power and coal. And so those are some of the issues that are getting worked out and also what it means to be integrating renewables on the grid increasingly and doing so optimally and efficiently. And Texas is really uh, a case study for that because we have one of the most diverse um, energy mixes on our grid. And everybody wants a technologically advanced economy. Absolutely, they're in demand, but they require a lot of energy. And this is just noting Texas exports. We're a large energy exporter. We were 83% of US energy exports and a very major LNG exporter in 2022. And a lot of that happened as a result of Russia invading Ukraine. And there was a call on US LNG by Europe in, in what we were already supplying um, to Asia. But there was an extra call and and that call will be happening in the future as well. Just again, to note really quickly, um, you know, the, the grids. Um, one stat that I heard at a conference was that up to 2030, there's going to be a 4% increase in power generation, in power demand because of technology needs with AI, quantum computing. Um, you know, they're huge power hungry power power hungry creatures. And so that's that's something that's you know going to have to be thought through because if, if those if there's going to be that kind of increase in power generation, well you need sources of power and that is natural gas, that's renewables, that's nuclear largely. It it can be some coal, but coal is absolutely out of you know largely out of favor in the United States and in Europe, although there's still a lot that that is being burnt. Um, so, you know, those are, that's the reality of this energy transition and by having more requirements because of technology on the grid, what that will mean for resources. And that's, that's sort of something I pay attention to. I uh, will stop sharing and just to wrap up again, um, you know, in the United States, obviously we have a market economy. And our stock market reflects a lot of a lot of the movements and the mo momentum and the sentiment, and and it's also a really good you know check and balance on on government spending, what the market will bear, and all that. So I think in some respects, you know, the United States is going to be a really interesting case study to see what this 
um, energy transition really looks like. There's already um, some, you know, cracks showing with the EV push and the renewables push um, that, you know, government policy has been pushing a little too hard, too fast, and the market's not bearing it exactly. So it's got to move slower and it's got to move in a way that makes economic sense and that, um, you know, can be afforded by the population um, and investment. And that, and that gets to FDI. One thing I want to just say about foreign direct investment is those countries that are considered, um, you know, not good countries, you know, risky, FDI will not be flowing there. And we're seeing a lot of that even with China, that there is an outflow of FDI. And, um, and that's just because of the government policies and their sentiment about the private sector. So I think the Middle East, various countries are getting a wake up call as to if you want foreign direct investment, if you want a diversified economy and you want these outside investors, which you absolutely need, then um, you have to have a, a, a positive investment climate and business climate. And increasingly the markets, um, it, call it ESG, um, the ESG lens, environmental, social, and governments, government policies, those matter to investors. And, um, and so, so countries really have to get their houses in order if they're going to attract that FDI. And we've seen that starting to happen with China, that there's a lot, there's a lot of attention on funds that are, you know, funding state-owned enterprises and that sort of thing. So again, you know, countries that don't trade fair, that aren't business friendly, um, and are hostile or risky, um, capital's not going to flow there. So that's sort of um, actually a segue into my a future talk I'm going to be given at a Seeking Alpha Investor Summit in New York City in the middle of June. Um, so I'm just sort of, you know, working out my thoughts, um, given some of my energy, energy um, presentations of late. Thank you for your time.